All right, good afternoon. So we shall go ahead and start. And uh, as we look back at the schedule, uh, you would have noticed that uh, I had the integumentary system, which is chapter six for uh, two days, yesterday and today. So I just decided to do it all in one setting. So we are go gonna finish the whole chapter hopefully today. Uh, that'll make it a little bit easier and more organized. Uh, also, I sent out uh, your study guide for your second lecture exam, which is coming up this uh, Tuesday. And I didn't realize uh, that the lab practical and the lecture exam were closely following each other. So in any case, that has been sent out and hopefully you guys received it. Um, all the lo logistics and the format continue to be the same. Uh, hopefully now you have a better idea of what things to focus on and how the exam is structured and uh, what things to pay attention to during uh, recorded lectures and things of that sort. Uh, so let me know if you have any questions, feedback, uh, suggestions, as always, you have my email address. Um, so yes, one more thing that just uh, uh, I was reminded of was uh, the case study. So that's something I will be sending out the guidelines for too. Hopefully the next couple of days over the weekend, I'm going to do that. And also I will be uh, creating your lab activities from last week on Sunday. Uh, so that, that all is coming up. You still have some time to turn work in if you were unable to do that. I've updated your grades as far as your uh, exam is concerned from Connect. So that should be on your Blackboard uh, gradebook. Feel free to check if you haven't already. Uh, and I believe that is everything that uh, needed to be talked about. So we shall, without further delay, go ahead and start with chapter six, and that has to do with the integumentary system, as you see here. So the word integument itself uh, means a covering, right? So the integumentary system is your outer covering of the body, which of course is your skin and the other associated organs that would be your hair, nails, sebaceous glands and sweat glands, okay? Hair follicles, of course. So they constitute the integumentary system. Now, uh, some things to remember, what type of epithelium are we talking about when we mention skin? Hopefully you remember from our discussion on chapter five, uh, keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, right? You have this layer of uh, tough, uh, durable, and uh, kind of elastic uh, protein called keratin, okay? Uh, which forms the outer boundary of your epidermis of the skin. It's made up of dead cells uh, filled with keratin. And that is the perfect type of epithelium for giving you uh, the best available protection against the outside world, pathogens, germs, infections, although, and also dehydration to prevent that, all right? Okay, on top of that, uh, something else to remember is that uh, the developmental origin of, uh, of your integ integumentary system, and that would be what? Your mesoderm. So remember, we talked about the three germ layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and then the endoderm, right? So remember, uh, the skin, the integumentary system is basically derived from the outermost layer, ectoderm, which makes sense because ecto means outside most, and that's what the skin basically is. So that's what we are looking at here. Uh, doctors who deal with uh, the skin, the human skin and its disorders and treatments are called dermatologists, as you can see here. And one of the highly sought after medical residencies, by the way, highly competitive, okay? Uh, because the uh, hours here are kind of nice and restricted, right? These doctors usually don't uh, deal with emergencies. They pretty much have a nine to five schedule, okay? Uh, sometimes in about 40 hours a week, if not less, and they get paid a bundle for, for their work. So it's nicely uh, compensated as well, and therefore makes it uh, one of the most competitive medical residencies to get into, right? Dermatology and other competitive residencies. So you might be wondering what are some other uh, specialties that are hard to get uh, as far as residencies are concerned, right? So the answer would be, uh, you would have guessed by now, uh, surgery in general, but neurosurgery, okay. Uh, cardiac surgery, of course. Orthopedics, bones, all right, that's highly competitive too. Uh, ophthalmology, 
eye special uh, specialty having to deal with uh, the disorders of the eye, right? Uh, and of course, dermatology, okay? So these are some of the most sought after. Uh, and also, as it says here, your skin is also a visual indicator of your underlying health, okay? So not always true. I tend to disagree with that statement a little bit, such as we talked about what? Uh, sun damage to the skin, right? So uh, the sun's ultraviolet type B radiation will cause wrinkles on your skin, right? And might uh, necessitate the use of Botox, not, I'm not recommended it, uh, recommending that by any means, but uh, it causes more breakdown of your skin versus someone who has not been exposed to the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation for long periods of time. Uh, but that does not necessarily mean that the person's blood vessels are in a similar shape, even though they both contain collagen, right? I mentioned it before. So the appearances could be deceptive at times. So it's not as clear cut. Somebody looks healthy and radiant and pink and glowing and the skin is unblemished and everything's good on the in inside, not always. Or somebody looks wrinkled and a little beat up. You think, oh, this person is gonna make the exit real soon. So no, not, not always. So um, something else to remember. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, genetic component involved here. That's one thing to remember. So if you come from a family of people with like kind of leathery skin who developed that early on, but lived on to be 120 years old, you're probably gonna go down the same path. So don't judge uh, necessarily uh, people's underlying health by means of uh, looking at outside indicators. But nonetheless, there are very important clinical signs and symptoms that you will pick up. So the difference between signs and symptoms again, um, of course is signs are things that you can see. Uh, like someone's uh, skin is turning yellow, as in jaundice, right? Or red, as in erythema, or blue, as in cyanosis. Um, a rash on somebody's skin, a bruise, a cut, scrape, whatever. That's a sign. Versus symptom is things that you can't see, but the patient subjectively tells you, I'm feeling dizzy, doctor, or I'm feeling weak or nauseous or something. You can't see it, or I'm, I feel like I have a fever. Um, so those would be symptoms, okay? Uh, the number one symptom that brings most people to see their primary care physician uh, for a symptom, uh, more, more than anything else, uh, is pain. And therefore, it's imperative that you ask as many questions about the patient's underlying pain than anything else, all right? Uh, what type of pain is it? How would you describe it? Is it like a dull, boring, achy kind of pain? Is it like an electric sharp shooting, stabbing type of pain? Where is it located at, of course? What time did it start? Uh, was there any other uh, 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 you know, a factor that made it worse. Uh, anything that makes it better, that alleviates it, what are some of the exacerbating factors? Uh, is it a constant pain or does it come and go in waves? How bad is this pain? Um, how would you classify this pain on, on a scale of one to 10, right? Uh, and then um, any history of any recent procedures, surgical or medical procedures that were, that were done, okay? Uh, all of these are important, extremely important questions to ask. All right, so here we are talking about the integumentary system. So two layers of the skin, the outermost one called the epidermis, epi in front, the first one, um, stratified squamous epithelium is the type, as I mentioned, and then the dermis is the underlying skin, which is not part of the integumentary system. So if you look here, right, uh, what, do you, what you do have in your dermis is connective tissue, areolar connective tissue, adipose connective tissue, blood vessels, sensory nerves, all of that good stuff. So here, this is an important picture. Uh, it's a nice diagram because it gives you a pretty good idea of what structures lie there, right? So here you're looking at the epidermis, which is made up of uh, what stratified squamous epithelium and keratinized. So you dead keratin cells. You can see how they block nicely fitting together like blocks, right? Like a mosaic. Uh, so then here, so this is your uh, epidermis. One thing to remember, the epidermis itself is made up of five different layers, four or five. And, and we'll mention that shortly here again. So, uh, and then underneath it, here is your dermis, all of this is dermis. The dermis again is divided into this layer called the papillary layer. Papilla means nipple in uh, Latin slash Greek. And looking at the appearance here of this pink tissue, you can see why it's called that, right? The papillary layer it looks like protruding nipples as you see. So, and then underneath is the reticular layer. Why retic reticular means like a network. And you can see there's a bunch of stuff here. You got hair follicles, you got uh, what? Uh, sweat glands here, you got sebaceous glands here. Uh, sensory nerves, mm, what else? Blood vessels, arterioles, venules, here's adipose. So 
Um, and also this muscle, not to forget, called the erector pili muscle, which literally means what? Uh, the muscle that makes your hair stand on end, erector pili muscle. This one, it gives you goosebumps whenever you're cold or highly emotionally excited or any of those conditions, the muscle contracts involuntarily and you have your hair standing on end. So you see all of those wonderful structures here in this picture, okay? So the five layers I was talking about as far as your epidermis is concerned, which again is made up of what? Keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, you have to remember. Okay, what are the five uh, layers here? Uh, the basal layer, stratum basale, as you can see, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, stratum corneum, five layers. One thing to remember, the fourth layer here, uh, stratum lucidum, uh, is only present in two areas uh, of your body. And what are, what are those areas? The so-called thick skinned areas, which would be the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. And these are the two places where uh, there's constant friction. You're picking objects up as humans. We use our hands all the time and feet for bipedal walking. So they're constantly in, in contact with outside uh, friction forces. Therefore, you need that added extra layer here, stratum, stratum lucidum. Everywhere else on your body, you have thin skin. So this fourth layer is missing. You only have uh, these ones. The first three are composed of living keratinocytes. Keratinocytes are cells that make keratin. The first three, the basal layer, the spinosum, and the granulosum. These two, uh, if lucidum is present, that is, are dead, made up of dead keratinized cells, okay? So three types of cells. Uh, that you will find in your basal layer. Keratinocytes, melanocytes, tactile cells. And the names tell you pretty much what they do. Keratinocytes, what do they do? They make keratin. Keratin is this tough protein that gives uh, resilience and youthful vigor and appearance to your skin, right? And so they synthesize keratin. Then melanocytes, and you would have guessed, they make the protein called melanin, which gives skin color. Uh, and skin color is, well, sometimes it's a charged uh, topic. It shouldn't be at all. Uh, but it's very interesting um, as to how people, um, like all other organisms and creatures, how humans also have evolved skin coloration depending on where they live or where their ancestors lived rather, right? So no surprises there. People who live close to the, uh, let me take quick notes, skin color evolution. Uh, so people who live closer to the equator, the center of the earth's belt, right? Uh, so Asian countries, uh, South Asia, uh, some of the Middle Eastern countries, Africa, Australia. Uh, if you look at the original people from there, Australian uh, Aboriginal people, Aborigines, if you will. Uh, so not surprisingly, they all tend to have a dark uh, skin, darker shades of skin, because of course, if you're living at the equator, you're uh, exposed to direct sunlight for 12, 14 hours uh, every day, right? Uh, so your skin is adapted to make more melanin, which protects you from the sun's har harmful ultraviolet radiation, right? Uh, and it's not like you don't need sun at all. You need at least five to 10 minutes of sun on a regular basis for your skin to make vitamin D, right? However, if you're getting more sun than that, or, or let me put it this way, if you have a lighter shade of skin and more, more, more sunlight is uh, piercing your skin than someone with a darker shade of skin, then that sunlight breaks down a compound called folate or folic acid. Folate or folic acid is a essential, it's an essential uh, nutrient, right? Organic nutrient, which your body needs for uh, neurodevelopmental uh, processes for your, for your nervous system to develop properly. In fact, in pregnant women who are deficient in folate or folic acid, um, and uh, the recommended dosage of folic acid is about one milligram per day, all right, at, for, for, especially for pregnant women. Uh, so they tend to have a higher incidence of delivering babies with um, spina bifida, a condition where the spine doesn't form properly or it's protruding to the outside in some serious uh, cases, right? Um, so too much sun and it destroys folic acid, right? Too little sun and you don't make vitamin D, your bones are weak and you have like bow-legged appearances and all those kinds of things. So your skin color is a perfect reflection of a balance between getting enough vitamin, uh, enough sunlight to make enough vitamin D, but not so much that your folate will break down or you develop skin cancer or something. So what is a very interesting, uh, kind of tragic for some people, but a, an interesting outshoot of this dis discussion, 
Guess which country has the highest rate of malignant melanoma in the world, right? Which country slash continent has the highest uh, incidence of skin cancers of all type, including, including uh, malignant melanoma, okay? What do you think? Uh, I wish I had this live discussion. I would have loved to get your responses here. I don't know, maybe you're saying, I, I see some of you saying Florida, right? Florida is not a country, it's a state. So uh, I'm just kidding. So uh, what else? It is a state. So uh, a US state, not, not a state as in a country. What else? Uh, some, some of you might be saying Africa or African countries and places like that. No, Australia, Australia. And why? Australia lies in the Southern hemisphere on the equatorial belt, lots of sun. What did the original Australian Aborigines and this term doesn't make sense to me, right? They call them the Aboriginals, right? Which means that they are not original, correct? Australian uh, Aborigines, Aborig or, or rather it means that their origin is not known. Uh, at the very least, uh, they were the original people who were there, right? Uh, just like Native Americans were the original inhabitants of North America, uh, but it seems like a distant memory. So, uh, so the Aborigines, they were the original inhabitants of Australia, right? If you look at them, they have the perfectly adapted, nicely dark, rich uh, skin color, which protects them from, which has that balance between vitamin D and folate, right? Uh, but then what happened that uh, uh, the British colonies started sending out people out to Australia, you know the history, right? So uh, it was a penal colony. So uh, criminals or people who were like, uh, undesired in Britain back in the day were sent to this continent called Australia. And so they created their own colony. Uh, and since they were of European descent, of course, they inherited the light skin. So no surprise now, because now you see a mismatch between the type of people living there uh, and the, uh, the topography and the climate of the place. The result, highest incidence of skin cancer in Australian, uh, European Australian people, all right? So there, it's 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 a, it's an interesting in, it, interesting uh, observation. On top of that, I myself have worked on a hypothesis. I call it the race hypothesis, and uh, so I made some observations about uh, things like how is it that light-skinned races seem to have dominated world cultures throughout. If you look at history, right, whether it's the Persians or the Romans or the Greeks or then the Mongols, even right and. Uh, modern day societies, it's, 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 it seems to be uh, that they have seemed to have more sway. So I was thinking about this, what, what does skin color have to do with anything, right? About the world culture and all that. Uh, and then one day I had a eureka moment and it just kind of made sense to me. So I've prepared that hypothesis. Uh, if any of you is interested in sharing that uh, or rather having access to that, email me and I'll be more than happy to share that with you. All right, so um, anyway, so melanin is what, that pigment is called, and it's uh, made in cells called uh, melanosomes, uh, melanosomes, as you can see here, and they shield your DNA from ultraviolet radiation, very important. Then on top of that, you also have tactile cells here. Uh, tactile means uh, touch. So they are sensitive to touch, all right? So then we move up to stratum spinosum. It's called that, which literally means spiny layer, because if you look at it under the microscope in a histological slide, you will see these, this spiny appearance to this skin layer, okay? What you have here are cells called the Langerhans cells, and these are the phagocytes or the Pac-Man cells, if you will, of the skin. So they eat up any of the germs, pathogens, or debris that might uh, be present there, all right? Uh, even tattoos. So when you go for tattooing, uh, you have to go deeper than this layer, than the stratum spinosum. Uh, if the tattoo, the dye is uh, here, then the Langerhans cells are gonna eat up and your tattoo is gonna disappear. Uh, pretty soon. So stratum granulosum, uh, this is where keratin cells start to die off and form the upper layers like stratum lucidum. This one is only found on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, what is called the thick skin, as you can see here. Stratum corneum, the cornea layer, it's thick and resilient because it's made up of uh, keratin, keratinized uh, dead keratin cells, as you can see. So uh, if you read here, dry, thickened surface, protective against abrasions and infection. So here, this is what your skin looks like on a microscopic uh, examination. What can you tell me about the origin of this uh, piece of skin? Which body part do you think it came from? So if you were paying attention, your eyes would 
immediately be directed to this layer, which is labeled as stratum lucidum. And you will say, aha, that's the only layer which is found in only in thick skin. So this uh, skin specimen is already either derived from someone's uh, soles of the feet or the palms of the hands. All right, so, so, and you have to play medical detective here. So there, we are looking at the differences between thick skin and thin skin. Okay, one more important clinical thing in this area, uh, era of COVID, right? Uh, lots of things going around about what causes it and how to protect yourself and whatever. I'll tell you what protects uh, you the best. Uh, just plain good old um, common sense and your gut instinct. It'll help you, right? Uh, I hope it will. Uh, things like staying away from people who, who are obviously sneezing or coughing or sick uh, and holding your breath. Uh, if you have to be in close proximity, wearing a mask does offer protection, right? Especially in the colder months, even more important, right? Uh, what else? A healthy diet, and nobody talks about that. Not uh, here on the popular media, right? People on plant-based uh, vegan or vegetarian or pescatarian, which means seafood and uh, vegetables primarily, right? Studies have shown consistently that people on uh, vegan, vegetarian, uh, and on pescatarian diets have either don't get infected or if they do, they have very mild symptoms. 75% of the people have 70% less uh, intensity um, uh, subjectively of the symptoms, right? So there you go. What you eat is who you are. You are what you eat, okay? Nobody talks about that. Uh, exercise, not many people talk about that either. Getting out every single day, walking, brisk walking, uh, doing yoga, swimming, tennis, whatever gets your heartbeat up on a regular basis, makes you sweat out, that will do it. Minimizing your stress will do it. And actually, I have a health mantra that I've come up with myself, and I will discuss it at some other time that I use to, um, to minimize risk, okay? So in any case, uh, what does that have to do with thick skin versus thin skin? Look at that. Thick skin, which is the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, uh, have no hair follicles, obviously, unless you're a werewolf, right? Werewolves, I think in mythology, are supposed to have hairy palms, right? I don't know about the soles of the feet. Maybe they don't even have feet, they have paws, who knows? Uh, but other than that, of course, you know that uh, we don't have hair follicles there, right? Or sebaceous glands. So that is an important point. What does that tell you about what happens when your nose starts to itch or you get this terrible urge to itch your nose and it's the era of COVID? or even any time when there's influenza, com common cold, all kinds of viruses going around, right? Uh, uh, so, right, so what some people would do, a lot of people would do, go like this, right? It's almost like a compulsive thing. They were like fiddling, playing with their nose. They can't sit still without doing that, right? But what did we just learn? The palms of the hand, and the soles of the feet do not have sebaceous glands. What do the sebaceous glands do? They secrete a bactericidal uh, antibiotic substance uh, called sebum. It has protective activity against, against what? Against viruses too, okay? Uh, it has IgA, which is an antibody against viruses. Not found here, not found on your palms. So, but if you did this, right? away from the hand, back of the forearm, this, then you have sebaceous glands, sebum there, which will stick to your nose and prevent infection. They'll cut it down infection, doing just simple things like this and you'll be okay, all right? Uh, unfortunately, that's not what is what makes the headline news. What makes the headline news is the billion dollar pharmaceutical drugs and vaccines and more chemicals that you need to put in your body, right? I mean, that's good. Uh, vaccination, I'm, I'm not uh, advocating against them or anything, but before you get to that point, there is so much more that nature has equip, equipped you with uh, to keep these conditions at bay, all right? So it's just plain good old sensible thinking. That's all that is needed here. So here's a discussion and a comparison between thick skin and thin skin. You can see the differences in the lack of stratum lucidum. It's not found in your thin skin. Okay, so skin color. What determines it, of course, uh, genetics and uh, sun exposure and also your diet, interestingly. So for example, if your diet is rich in fish, uh, right? Such as if you are a pescatarian, right? Fish diet and skin color. 
So apparently fish has uh, an amino acid called tryptophan, uh, which uh, tyrosine actually, which leads to tryp tryptophan, which makes uh, melanin. So hypothetically speaking, the more your fish consumption, the darker your skin will be because uh, more tryptophan, more tyrosine, more melanin there, okay? So that also in, uh, influences your ultimate skin color. Uh, but most importantly, it's your genetics and it's your sun exposure, okay? Hemoglobin. So again, if you look at people who are light skin and who live on like higher elevations, right? Let's say Scandinavian people up on the mountains or people from Colorado here, uh, you, they tend to have this reddish tinge to their cheeks uh, and it, to the body in general. And that's because when you live on a higher elevation, there's a lower concentration of oxygen. And how does their body, body physiologically respond to this by um, pumping out extra hemoglobin and red blood cells to capture as much um, oxygen as they can. So that gives them that ready complexion, right? Uh, melanin, we talked about that, of course. Uh, people who are albinos, albinism, which is a recessive trait. It's a recessive trait. So if your parents had a recessive gene on both sides and you happen to inherit that, that's when you uh, become an albino. Could be, it could, could be complete albinism or partial albinism. Uh, in either case, you lack melanin in your skin and your, in your eyes. And it's not only humans, all creatures show this variation, all right? Um, okay, so, and then carotene. Now this is a yellowish orange pigment, which is derived from, excuse me, um, vegetables, uh, which are yellowish orange, like carrots and squash and what else? Um, um, you know, all the, all the vegetables that come to mind. So, and carotene also uh, tends to accumulate in your skin layers and you see that yellowish red coloration there as well. So here you can see your melanocytes, the melanin being produced. Here's this not nice dark uh, melanin that you see, okay? Um, okay, so here are we looking at some of the markings on your skin, okay? Skin markings, okay, what are they? Uh, a mole, so most people have them, right? Moles are simply hyperpigmented areas on your body, which are completely harmless. They might even be considered a sign of beauty in some cultures and other traits are ascribed to them or whatever. Uh, but in rare cases, they can be of some concern, especially if they're changing their shape and their color and their consistency, con consistency too fast. And we talk about what those uh, risk factors and warning signs are shortly here. Freckles, again, are uh, clusters of moles, if you will. Again, hyperpigmented areas, especially found on your sun-exposed areas, um, and more apparent if you are light-skinned. They can happen in every any person, uh, but they're more observable if you have light skin. Hemangiomas, benign blood vessel tumors, like port wine stains and those kinds of things, uh, again, completely benign. They're not, not, not of any concern. Uh, friction ridges are your fingerprints. And you would have known this by now that every single human being that has ever lived or will ever live on this planet has a, a different pattern of, uh, of the fingerprints. So like arches and whorls and loops and combination appearances, as you see here. Uh, and remember, no two people have, uh, I mean, no person within themselves has the exact same fingerprint pattern on their two hands, they're different. We also have soul prints or footprints, which are completely different for, in, in the two feet as well, something to remember. Okay, so ultraviolet radiation and why it's important to use sunscreens, but I was just looking at this study, didn't surprise me much, but even sunscreens, uh, 40 to 50% per, per, percent of those uh, famous brands were found to have high levels of benzene, which, uh, which causes, which is a carcinogen, it causes cancer, right? So interestingly, you're putting sunscreen to prevent cancer, uh, which itself has benzene in it, which can cause cancer. So it's, again, it's about balance. It's about homeostasis when you really need it and when you don't need it. So uh, yeah, these are some studies that were done as well. But ideally, if you're using a sunscreen, it should have a, a high enough sun protection factor, 15 or more, so that uh, you don't get exposed um, and do not stand the risk of DNA mutations in your skin cells and, uh, and malignant melanomas and skin cancers. As you trim your roses, a thorn 
penetrates your palm through all epidermal strata. What are the layers of the epidermis penetrating? So what were they? Stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and stratum basil or basili. Uh, the process of keratinization, the bottom three layers have living cells in them, the top two are dead keratin. Why is it important? It gives uh, protection in dehydrative, uh, dehydration prevention capabilities to your skin. How does hemoglobin contribute to skin color? It gives you that reddish tinge. Uh, what is the function of friction ridges of your fingerprints? Uh, to help you grasp objects actually, right? So fingerprints are kind of like, and footprints too. So your feet can be planted safely for bipedal walk. All right, then the dermis is up next. Two layers, papillary layers of dermis, as we talked about before, and then the underlying reticular layer of dermis. There you are. So here you have, uh, what have you done? You have uh, removed the papillary layer. You see the nipple like projections here from the underlying reticular layer, right? You see that uh, and all of the structures that we mentioned before. Okay, so very important. If you are a plastic surgeon or a general surgeon for that matter, and uh, you are doing some any kind of surgical procedure on your patient, right? So let's, okay, look at this patient here. Look at the surgical incision that was made. Based on this picture, what organ do you think or what organs uh, could have been the subject of this operation? Just looking at, look at what is this place? It's your left hypochondrium, right? Left hypochondrium, possibly, well, yeah, it's mostly your left hypochondrium. So what organs come to mind in your left hypochondrium? Stomach, right? Spleen, pancreas, uh, even part of your colon, right? Your transverse and then your descending colon any or all of those organs might have been involved in this incisions. But regardless, what am I going to pay attention to as a competent plastic surgeon? Look at something called the lines of cleavage. So what are those lines indicating in this person? These lines, and, and, and notice how this person is standing in the anatomical position, very important. It's not hanging upside down or posing sideways or anything. This is the anatomical position. That's how you always uh, visualize a patient for reference, okay. So uh, these lines are indicating the orientation of the collagen fibers. This is how you, the collagen fibers are arranged throughout your skin. They run in this direction, okay? This is the natural tendency in people. So very important to remember this. Now, uh, so this surgeon, he was paying attention or she was paying attention to, during their uh, TCC ANP lectures on chapter um, six with Dr. Khan. And so, when they made the incision here, they were very careful and sure to, 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 to assure that this surgical cut went parallel to the lines of cleavage in this area. Job well done, because when this person is in their post-op uh, recuperating phase, this uh, incision is likely going to heal up very nicely with minimal scarring and chances of infection or hemorrhage or bleeding. This person was sleeping during the lectures uh, or listening to uh, their favorite rapper or whatever. And so when they ended up with the situation, this is what they did. They put that surgical incision uh, at a perpendicular, at a 90 degree angle across the uh, lines of cleavage, okay? So when this patient uh, went home and recuperated from the surgery, they developed a, an ugly scar which was likely to burst something called the de, de, um, de, dehiscence, all right, or dehiscence, I'm gonna write it here, uh, rupturing of the surgical scar and developed hemorrhage, bleeding and infection and promptly sued the surgeon and he or she ended up paying thousands of possibly millions of dollars because they didn't pay attention. So that's the importance of lines of cleavage. Know the cut and know the orientation of those collagen fibers so you don't, don't end, end up botching some surgical procedure and giving ugly cosmetic results. Tattoos, if you put them in, make sure that you have went, you have gone past the stratum granulosum because you don't want the Pac-Man cells to eat up the dye and the tattoo would be gone and you'll be back for more. Uh, so, so if you go deeper though, some of the older tattoos, they were permanent, right? So they stayed there forever. Uh, but now we have newer inks available. We even have laser uh, technology to either put tattoos in or remove them. So not, not, not a problem now. 
Subcutaneous layer, all right, this is not part of your integumentary system, primarily made up of your um, areolar and adipose fat, connective tissue. Here's the function, protection, energy storage and insulation, uh, and also common site for giving someone in injections, all right? So uh, what types of injections come to mind uh, when you think of the subcutaneous or the hypodermic layer, all right? Uh, injections in hypodermis. What comes to mind? And again, I wish we had this in person, but I hear some of you at least saying, hopefully, uh, well, EpiPen, right? EpiPen for allergies, adrenaline. And some of you are shouting out uh, insulin. Yes, and that is correct, insulin too. Uh, and some of you might even be saying contraceptives, birth control shots, birth control shots. And I would say, yes, yes, that's all true. Exactly, yes. So those are the injections or, uh, which are administered in the subcutaneous area because uh, as we mentioned, and we saw in the picture, there's a lot of blood vessels in this area. So there's rapid diffusion and spreading of uh, the drug uh, rapidly throughout the system, okay? So compare and contrast the papillary versus reticular layer of the dermis. Papillary layer, nipple-like projection, reticular layer, lots of stuff there, hair follicles, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, whatnot, all of them. What is indicated by the lines of cleavage in the skin? The orientation of the fibers of collagen. Why is it this medically important? You don't want to give anyone ugly scars. What type of tissue form the subcutaneous layer? Adipose and areolar tissue primarily, okay? At this point, I also mentioned a special type of scar tissue called... Uh, keloids. Uh, and keloids are commonly seen in uh, people of African uh, or uh, Asian heritage. Okay, it's more common as compared to people of Caucasian heritage. Keloids are these bunched up scars that pop up wh wherever you have gone for things like uh, nose piercings or ear piercings or any other trauma to the skin. It The skin heals itself by hyper, hyper healing itself, right? So layer over layer of uh, skin is laid down. Those are called keloids, okay? And so ethnicity has something to got to do with it and to sometimes for uh, cosmetic procedures, you might have to uh, like excise or cut out that area uh, and also make sure that there's no infection going on there. All right, so antibiotics might be needed in some areas as well. Right, so we are looking at the functions of the integument uh, or the skin and the associated organs here, which of course entail uh, protection from the outside environment, uh, primarily two things, infections and dehydration. And this is the reason why if you work in the uh, burns ward in the hospital, such as uh, when I did my plastic surgery rotation, and that was the case, let's see. Um, Okay, here. Yes. My plastic surgery rotation and burns ward. And this was my very last rotation for my first year of uh, medical in internship, all right? And uh, so, and I enjoyed the fact that it was rather relaxed. Uh, I started out with medical ICU and so the most intensive beginning that you could have. And then I wound up things with uh, plastic sur surgery at the end of the year, which is uh, one of the more relaxed uh, rotations. So uh, we didn't have any night calls during plastic surgery rotations. We had to stay on uh, every third day till evening, um, but no overnight calls there. Uh, so in any case, during my time um, there, we also had like a burns unit right next to there. And so that's where we dealt with uh, people coming in with first, second and third degree burns. And the major risk to these people's welfare was again, two things, infections and dehydration. And that comes as no surprise because, as I mentioned before, uh, that those are the two things that your skin keeps away or keeps in rather uh, to uh, maintain homeostasis. Okay, uh, and that's exactly what we are looking at here. All right. Uh, in addition, of course, the skin is a metabolic organ. Interestingly, it's also part of your endocrine system in the sense that it makes vitamin D. Uh, 
in sunlight, okay? And we talked about the whole picture of uh, the balance between getting too much sunlight versus too little uh, and how that goes. Secretion and absorption, of course, uh, things that you can apply to your skin like topical creams, ointments, uh, drug patches like Nicoderm patch, right? For uh, people who are trying to quit smoking, uh, birth control patches as well. Uh, they can be applied there to the skin as well. Um, uh, and the skin secretes sweat and sebum. We talked about that too. And immune function, you have dendritic cells or Langerhans cells, which uh, have an immune function. They are phagocytes. Temperature regulation of the skin and sensory reception. The skin is quite sensitive, right? Okay, so how does the skin produce vitamin D uh, by exposure to sunlight? Is the skin entirely waterproof? Uh, not entirely, but for the most part, it's not waterproof because sweat can still get across. What are some ways the skin can dissipate excess heat? By vasodilation of the blood vessels close to the skin, so you lose heat there, and also by sweating. Okay, nails is uh, that part of your integumentary system that we're looking at next. And nails are nothing but modified skin, and they have the same type of epithelium, uh, which is what your um, stratified, kerat keratinized stratified squamous epithelium is what we have. Modified skin at the tips of the fingers and the toes, right? And uh, so these are the different parts of the human nail, as you can see, uh, the nail body, the entire body of the nail, of course, uh, the cuticle from where the nail, ari nail arises here, uh, also called the uh, eponychium, the lunula, this crescent shaped area here, uh, the fold of the nail, and then the free edge that hangs over the skin, as you can see here. So one of the most common questions that I get here is, well, doc, if uh, I or somebody I know ends up damaging the nail, it's removed, is it gonna grow back? So that reminds me of a personal application that I came across a few years back. So my oldest son, uh, he's 15 now, uh, doing his uh, driver's, uh, his learner permit lessons these days, right? So I think about five or six years back, uh, he basically got a gift on his birthday from his uh, mom's mother, uh, my uh, mother-in-law, of course. Um, and that was like a go-kart kind of thing, right? And uh, even though it was... Uh, powered by some sort of battery. Uh, now that thing could go fast. I'd say it hit a decent 30, 35 miles an hour when going at top speed. And uh, I was not in favor, am not in favor of, uh, you know, high speed, high impact uh, toys, uh, especially when he was younger, but nonetheless, he got that. And uh, in spite of my uh, muted protests, uh, they went ahead and he started trying it out. Uh, and the next thing I know, as I had suspected after a few minutes, uh, he comes uh, crying back in, holding his right hand with his left hand. And he is like throwing a fit. He is crying uh, hysterically and everyone in, uh, else rushes in with him. Uh, and the next thing I see is uh, like blood drip, dripping down his hand and uh, onto the carpet. So as it happened, uh, he was driving that thing at top speed. And so he made a turn. And of course, he hadn't uh, gotten his learner's permit back then, didn't have the sense that you have to slow down before you make a turn. So what happened had the, the, the car was, uh, it, it tilted, right? Because of the rapid turn. And so instinctively he put his hand down to support himself. And now this is a car going at 25, 30 miles an hour. Uh, and so his uh, hand, uh, especially the fingernail of his index finger, right, uh, of his right finger, it, it scraped against the road. Uh, at that point, he didn't realize what had happened. So he brought the car to a stop. And when he got down from the car, that's when somebody noticed it and said, hey, you're bleeding. And that's when he looked at his hand and he freaked out even more and almost fainted there, right? So, uh, then of course, needless to say, we uh, I washed out the wound instantly, run cold water over it, uh, and then took a look and it seemed like most of his nail had been removed. I could see his entire like uh, nail bed, it was pretty badly mangled, it was bleeding too. Uh, 
but one thing that I did notice among all these um, happenings at the same time was that I could see his nail, but part of his nail bed was still there, okay? So what did they tell me? Fortunately, in this case, his nail was gonna grow back, okay? And so he was freaking out. He thought he was gonna just bleed to death or something. And I just told him, okay, so we are gonna clean it up. We put a bandage on. And um, since you have your nail bed still there, part of it at least, your nail is gonna regrow. So it took some coaxing and some comforting and eventually he settled down. So that's what we did. We put on some antibiotic cream uh, on their triple anti antibiotic and we bandaged the wound. And sure enough, uh, next two weeks, we could see the beginnings of a new nail. Next six months, his nail was back, thankfully, okay? So that's the answer uh, for people who wonder about whether the nail is gonna grow back or not. If you have part of your nail bed still there intact, nail is gonna come back. But if the entirety of the nail bed has been removed due to the injury, uh, then all you will have there is a scar tissue. So nails are also a good diagnostic tools. There are many conditions that you can diagnose look by looking at nails, like brittle nails, okay? They break easily, could be due to malnutrition, could be due to uh, vigorous activities and profession that you're involved in, right? Ingrown nails uh, because of like tight gloves or something, or uh, tight socks, tight shoes for toenails, they can grow backwards and burrow into the skin and cause an infection. Um, onychomycosis, which is a fungal infection, the nails, nails tend to turn yellowish. Um, again, when you wear your socks for long periods of time and you sweat, um, so fungus like warm, damp places, dark places, so you might have that infection there. Also, people who are diabetic, their immune system is not functioning as it should. They are also at higher risk for developing fungal infections. Uh, yellow nail syndrome, uh, you, you can also see uh, clubbing of the nails, where the nails become like club shaped, right? They're like broader at the tips, club nail. And this is more common in people with, who are smokers and COPD sufferers, chronic ob obstructive pulmonary disease. They tend to have, cro so if chronic smokers, if you look at their hands, you'll notice their fingernails, the clubbing, clubbing of the nails is club shaped nails is what you will see. So clubbing of nails and COPD. All right. Spoon nails, the outer surf nail is concave. It's like a spoon, okay? Spooning of the nails can happen as well. Uh, so all these kinds of conditions um, you might see. So hair is the next step, which is found everywhere on the human body, except for the palms and the soles of the feet, right? And uh, there's three types, three varieties, which are discussed here, lanugo, velus, and terminal, terminal hair. What's the difference? Lanugo is this fine downy hair um, that a, an infant is born with on the shoulders, back, everywhere. So this is a, an, a reminder of our mammalian heritage. We have body here like any other mammal, uh, and we tend to lose it, that the shaggy coat uh, is disposed of. Sometimes uh, we just continue on like the uh, the werewolf boys, right? These were like used as circus performers. Uh, I think they're, uh, these. It, it was a family in Mexico who can, suffered from a condition called hypertrichosis. Hypertrichosis, also informally called the werewolf syndrome. So it's a genetic, genetic anomaly, of course. And uh, as mammals, it's basically something that we all have. And some people, it's thicker than usual, right? Um, the vellus here are these fine hair that you have on your arms and on your legs. And these are genetically determined. So if you had thick uh, ancestors of yours who had thick hair on their arms and uh, legs, you basically inherit that. Finally, we have terminal hair and these are sex hormone recept receptive and sensitive. So terminal hair grow thick in response to surges in testosterone or estrogen, your sex hormone. So hair on your face, the beard, uh, hair, chest hair, back hair, pubic hair, axillary hair, all of those are uh, examples of terminal hair, okay? And so they are sensitive to, to the sex hormones and that's when they grow. All right. Uh, so these are the different parts. Uh, of hair, uh, as you can see here, here's the hair follicle, which digs all the way down into the dermis, right? Uh, and then the connective tissue all around it. This is the medulla of the hair, the middle portion. The outer portion is called the cortex of the hair. This is this dilated part, it's called the hair, hair bulb. So you see all of those features here in this picture. Functions of hair, many different ones. Protection, the scalp hair for protection from sun rays to the top of the head, beard, 
protects the face from, again, the elements and so on, facial expression here, accentuate those heat retention as well, sensory reception, right? Here we are sensitive to touch, visual identification, who is who, males versus females and so on, uh, and even chemical signal dispersal of pheromones. So interestingly, especially here in your axilla, the armpit hair and the pubic hair, they're also secreting so-called human pheromones, uh, signaling your puberty to a protect prospective sexual partner, okay? So uh, pheromones, it's, this is not body odor that we're talking about here, right? So it's, it's, it's your natural body smell after you've showered and everything. All right, so hair color again is a mixture of, uh, is a product of your genetics, your diet and uh, the lifestyle, right? So going gray basically happens because uh, the amount of melanin breaks down um, after a certain age. So roughly speaking, 50% uh, of 50 year olds have 50% of their hair uh, white or gray, all right? So the 50% rule for gray, let's call it that 50% gray rule. And uh, just look at your ancestors, all right? It's a genetic thing. So Caucasians in general uh, notice the first grays in the late 20s, early 30s. For uh, Asians, it's like late 30s, early 40s. And for people of African or black descent, it's like mid 40s to late 40s, okay? All right. Hair loss, uh, something called uh, alopecia, as you can see here, it could be due to aging. So you have like something called male pattern baldness. Uh, or androgenic alopecia. And that has to do with your testosterone levels uh, and also your genetics um, and the genes that men inherit mostly from their mom's side. So look at your maternal uncles, all right? And the uh, hair growth pattern that they followed, most likely that would be your destiny as far as hair, is con hair are concerned as well. So let's say maternal uncles and hairline, okay? So you need uh, normal male levels of testosterone and the gene for baldness. And so that's what uh, promotes it, all right? Diffuse hair loss could be due to nutritional deficiencies, certain diseases like psoriasis of the skin or uh, lupus or those kinds of things. Pursuitism, now this is excessive male pattern hairiness in females. So if you see a female who is showing like male pattern growth, like a beard, a thick mustache, or you know, hair like that, uh, a number of factors come to mind. Uh, things like Cushing syndrome, that's one possibility, all right? Uh, another thing which is rather common is PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, all right? So uh, Cushing syndrome, what was that? Uh, hypercortisolism, when your levels of cortisol, which is your stress hormone, uh, are, is chronically elevated either because of a tumor or chronic stress. Uh, one of the things it does is it causes male pattern hair growth in females. Polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS is uh, becoming more and more common because our body masses are getting heavier and heavier. Um, and so obesity is a major risk factor for that. And then once you develop polycystic ovaries, then they cause obesity on, on top of that. So it's like a vicious cycle uh, that has yeah, evolved here, right? Um, and so controlling your diet and exercise, and uh, it, there's a predominant genetic pattern to it too, so which you cannot help, but you certainly can help your uh, diet and uh, exercise patterns, some things to keep in mind. Okay, sweat glands, uh, those are examples of merocrine glands, right? So watery secretions, as you can see here, and they produce the secretions by exocytosis, which is an active process. And sweat is mostly water, 99% water and some dissolved salts and urea maybe and some uh, fatty acids on there too. Um, epocrine sweat glands, they secrete a specialized type of sweat, which is secreted in your armpits, in your groin and around the nipples, which has that characteristic smell, okay? And it has that smell because it's rich in fatty acids and, and bacteria metabolize those fatty acids and therefore give it th that characteristic smell, all right? Uh, and epocrine sweat glands become active again under the influence of sex hormones uh, at the time of puberty. Uh, sebaceous glands uh, or sebum secreting oil glands of the skin. And look at that, they kill bacteria. They also have IgA, which uh, kills viruses too. So again, this is the way to wipe your nose and not using your palms. We talked about that earlier. Sebaceous glands also get, uh, they respond to sex hormones. So uh, that's why a lot of teenagers who are going through puberty, they develop acne. Acne is nothing but blocked uh, pores 
uh, uh, those oil gland and sweat gland pores that become clogged because of excessive oiliness. And these clogged pores get infected with bacteria, develop acne. Treatment is to wash your face regularly, keep good hygiene. Uh, you can't do much about your genetics or your sex hormone levels, but eating healthy diet, uh, staying away from things like chocolate and oily, greasy foods, uh, protecting your skin from the sun and minimizing stress levels, getting enough sleep, all of those are helpful. Uh, measures that you can take. Ceruminous glands are uh, wax secreting glands found in the external ear canal. Uh, and they pr produce ear wax, uh, which can get impacted and cause like partial to complete deafness. Most types of deafness are actually related to over secretion of uh, wax by the ceruminous glands. Memory glands in females, again, are interestingly modified sweat glands. Only they secrete milk, modified sweat with nutrients. Uh, on there. So here is a cross section of the exocrine glands of the skin. Again, exocrine glands, they call that because they secrete their secretions to the external surfaces of the body, like your sweat glands and your oil secreting sebaceous glands, right? You see both of them here in this picture. We talked about acne. Uh, some other medical treatments that you can use here is vitamin A like compounds like retin A cream. Uh, so you can apply that and it also helps with. Uh, resolving the issue here. However, you uh, ret Retin-A is sensitive. It makes your skin photosensitive. So make sure you're not being exposed to direct sunlight if you have uh, Retin-A, vitamin A-like compounds on your skin. And acne in some cases can lead to scarring if untreated because these infections, infected pustules, they heal with scar tissue formation. What is the difference between the aponychium and the hyponychium of a fingernail? Aponychium is the top part, hyponychium is the a part underneath. Uh, what are the three zones of a hair, the medulla, the cortex, and the, sh uh, the bulb? How does hair function in protection and heat retention? We talked about that. How do apocrine sweat glands differ from American? Apocrine sweat glands tend to smell because they have more fatty acids in them, and they are located in your armpits, groins, and around the nipples. What do sebaceous glands secrete? An oil called sebum, and it's secreted in the hair follicle. So the oil lubricates your uh, hair. All right, so uh, if you get a cut on your skin, how does your skin heal itself? Two ways, regeneration and fibrosis. Regeneration is by mitosis, and mitosis is a cell division where your original cell, parent cell divides into daughter cells, okay? Uh, fibrosis is scar formation, like keloids that we talked about, right? So this is when your uh, cuts and bruises and scrapes or whatever, they are... Uh, being filled up with excessive amounts of collagen. So you get a scar. Scar is not functional. No hair will grow there, no sweat glands, and it tends to bleed and uh, uh, rupture open much more commonly, something to keep in mind, okay? So what happens if you get a wound, uh, like a penetrating injury to the skin? Here's a picture, here's the wound. Uh, bleeding takes place, of course, these underlying blood vessels are cut. So here's uh, your blood accumulation. And then uh, these fibroblasts, the scar forming cells are spurred into action right away. Macrophages are attracted to the area and they clean up the any pathogens that might have entered the skin at that point. Neutrophils, same thing. They're the Pac-Man cells that eat up germs. And then uh, granulation tissue starts to form. What is granulation tissue? Uh, regeneration tissue, as you can see. So here, regeneration has taken place. Uh, and the fibroblasts have also formed some scar tissue here. So these are the stages in wound healing. So Rai says it is an autoimmune disorder. Therefore, by definition, it's more common in females. Uh, females tend to have more autoimmune conditions. We talked about that before. Um, if rumor is to be believed, Kim Kardashian uh, herself uh, also has uh, some degree of psoriasis, right? So I'm in the know because of my high school students. So they keep discussing things like that. So Right, let's see, Kim Kardashian health condition. So what happens here is psoriasis is all about dry, scaly, itchy skin. Uh, either it's an autoimmune process, but like exposure to the sun, stress, uh, even an injury to the skin and a family history of psoriasis, they are major risk factors, all right? So this whitish, scaly, patchy skin, uh, as we see here, and treatment, again, since it's an autoimmune disorder, you will uh, use topical steroids because steroids dampen the response, the immune response. So it's not a treatment, but it will temper down the, the inflammation, the, the, the autoimmune disorder that you see here. Ultraviolet light therapy, right? Uh, 
and some medications in severe cases that will cut out mitosis, kind of like anti-cancer or chemotherapeutic uh, medications, they will do it, okay? And uh, one extreme case of psoriasis that I would like to mention here is something called Harlequin ichthyosis, okay? And I think uh, sharing an image of what that exactly is would probably be more helpful. So let me take a look here. Let's call it Harlequin ichthyosis images. All right, there you go. And so as hard as it is to believe, uh, this is a real picture. It's not photoshopped, okay? Uh, so unfortunately, in these cases, this is an extreme uh, form of genetic psoriasis. It is common in families where there's a family history of severe skin disease, including psoriasis, and especially where there, there's been a lot of intermarriages. Uh, so some clans in the, uh, in the Middle Eastern regions, they have like outbreaks of more commonly, uh, this condition is more commonly seen there, okay? And so as you can see, it's like fish, like ichthyosis. Ichthyology is the study of fish, right? So ichthyosis literally means like fish-like skin, okay? Fish-like. And Harlequin were those uh, old time clowns and like jesters in a court and stuff like that. So because of the uh, appearance here, so fish-like scaly skin, which is prone to cracks and infections, as you can see, uh, the eyelids are so contracted that they don't even close properly. So the eyeballs tend to bleed. Unfortunately, as you see here, they cannot, the mouth cannot be closed because of the tight skin all around. Same with the nostrils, as you can see, okay? So unfortunate condition. Uh, and in that severe form, survival is extremely rare. Nonetheless, some people with minor forms of uh, harlequin ichthyosis, such as what we see here in the picture, have survived, okay? Uh, some have survived to adulthood and beyond as well. So, so as we can see, all right? Okay, so let's get back here. Burns. Uh, so we talked about three different uh, degrees of burns, okay? Um, first degree, second degree, and third degree burns. So what are they? First degree burn. Uh, includes redness and pain to the area, all right? And it's just, it's restricted to your epidermis. Some epidermal damage is there, such as uh, if you touched a hot object, and moved your hand instant, uh, instantaneously, uh, you might develop something like that. So not much treatment is needed there. Just run cold water over it. And most of it basically will uh, heal on its own, the skin will. Second degree burns are a little more uh, penetrating. So they go all the way down. Uh, sometimes to the dermis as well, and you tend to form blisters. Why? Because uh, this burn causes your epidermis to detach from your dermis. So this is a blister and it fills up with fluid. Never pop those blisters in an attempt to drain those uh, the, the liquid from there. That can lead to infections. Uh, so the blisters will heal on their own with, uh, with continued care. So silver nitrate cream is something you can apply there, right? Uh, keep the area uh, good hydration for the patient. Sometimes IV hydration is what is needed. Slight scarring is what you see here. Third degree burns are the worst of all, where there's deep damage to your epidermis, dermis, sometimes all the way down to your bone. Even that is charred. You see it in like firefighters and uh, people who are in, in, in that kind of situation, right? Uh, and this is life threatening because no skin is there. You need to graft the skin on. You need to keep them hydrated, IV hydration and pain free. Now, that is what you need um, in these uh, in these circumstances. Also, caloric intake, you have to feed them sometimes IV fluids like uh, uh, Ringer's lactate and those kinds of things, okay? So, uh, and paradoxically, even though these are the most serious of burns, um, they are painless, okay? Uh, they're painless because uh, even the nerves that carry pain signals to the brain are burnt off, they're charred, so you don't feel any pain. Uh, but that, that does not mean that uh, there's anything less about the severity of this uh, and the grave consequences that that, that you will uh, likely face. And painlessness, all right, something to remember. So here's the treatment again, prevent dehydration, control pain management, and uh, prevent infections. That's basically what it is. And removing dead tissue as well, something called debridement. So if there's like uh, shrapnel and stuff, which is like 
uh, embedded there, you have to take that stuff out. You have to clean out the wound because it's not going to heal otherwise. You're going to form a granulation tissue and the infection will fester for much longer. So that is what granulation tissue is uh, when your uh, wound is trying to heal. So it includes some dead cells, neutrophils, macrophages, and fibroblasts. When does it appear during wound healing of the skin? Uh, in the final stage of, of wound healing, right? All right, so all we need to know here is that uh, the skin develops from your ectoderm, the primary germ layer. What happens with aging to your skin? It basically loses its elasticity. It becomes wrinkled. Uh, you're more prone to develop dehydration and infections because it thins out as well, as you can see here, right? Uh, you start losing hair as well. Ultraviolet radiation damage, the more sun that you have accumulated sun exposure over your lifetime, the greater your chances of developing wrinkles and thinner skin and uh, even skin cancers, all right? Fair skin individuals at highest risk. We talked about that as well. There's three types of those skin cancers, right? There's malignant melanoma, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, and basal cell carcinoma. Uh, the third one, basal cell carcinoma, is actually one of the least uh, invasive cancers of all. Uh, in fact, my uh, professor used to joke that if you were to get one type of cancer and you have to choose one, right? Uh, this would be the one that you'd go for, basal cell carcinoma, because it's localized, doesn't spread, and uh, dissemination of metastasis is almost uh, never unheard of in these cases, right? So what you see with basal cell cancer is something called rodent ulcers. So these are like, they're called rodent ulcers because these are like wounds or ulcers on your nose or the uh, corner of the mouth that almost look like a mouse or some kind of a rodent nod at it, right? Um, and therefore the name rodent ulcers. Uh, and so that is what you characterist characteristically see with, with basal cell cancers. Botox and wrinkles. So Botox, what is it? Interestingly, it's derived from the most potent venom toxin in nature, the Clostridium botulinum toxin, okay? That's where the name comes from, Bo from botulinum and Tox from toxin, right? Botox. So this Toxin will kill you, it causes botulism in young children and even adults, it causes muscle paralysis. But you can take the same toxin and dilute it with lots of water. And if you inject it in strategic places, it causes a paralysis of the underlying facial muscles. So therefore, when you make your facial gestures, uh, since the skin is paralyzed, those wrinkles don't form here, okay? It's a temporary effect, but you have to go for these injections uh, again and again. It could be a painful process. In rare cases, it might cause like infections, bleeding, or even paralysis, like a stroke-like paralysis of the face as well. So what are the two primary germ layers that form the integument? Primarily, it is your ectoderm, uh, but the hypodermis is formed by mesoderm. How do ultraviolet rays contribute to skin aging? They cause breakdown and mutation of the DNA in your skin cells. All right, so there we have it. We are done with chapter six. So uh, use your study guides to prepare for your lab exam on Monday and lecture exam on Tuesday. I will be grading all your work on Sunday. Uh, lecture quizzes are still there, so take them as we go. I will be sharing the guidelines for your case studies shortly here, uh, and have a wonderful long weekend. I'll see you all virtually on Monday, so stay safe and have a great one. Bye-bye.